I was to ask you what is my favourite hobby, I guess last week's notice would probably um, have given the game away. But anyone want to shout out what they think my favourite hobby is? <laughs> Astronomer photography, something like that, yeah. It's photography, yes, but astrophotography, astronomy. And I've got something I want to show you this morning which is quite special. You ready? One of my prized possessions, the smaller of the two scopes that I've got. So, it's quite nice. What do you reckon, yeah? Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah, yeah. got um, very, very good optics in it. And what do we use telescopes for? Looking at things in the distance, right? Obviously. And I want to tell you, if Clive was on the pier down at Bognor today, I could look through this and spot a tiny speck on his eyebrow. That's how good this is, all right? I have seen a cow jump over the moon once with this as well, so... <laughs> now... If I was to look at a mountain range through that thing, say the Grampians in Scotland. Anyone ever been to the Grampians? Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? Really is. Beautiful, beautiful thing. And if you were to look through it, you wouldn't see that because that's not the Grampians, but you would see something like that. And can you see from this picture that you've got kind of some, a, a row of mountain peaks at the front... Then you've got some more mountain peaks at the back, and then you've got some even more mountain peaks behind that, almost like three rows of mountain peaks, really. And I want to tell you something. When I was 18 years old, which is only a couple of years back now, um, when I was 18 years old, I went round Europe with my mate Steve on the trains, OK, for a, for a month. And now, Steve and I, he probably will never listen to this recording, but the reality of the matter is, Steve and I are chalk and cheese. He's the kind of person who seems to be far more laid back than me. He can sort of sit around and not be too bothered about anything. On the other hand, I'm a very impetuous kind of individual. Certainly 18 I was, and I was always on the move trying to get anywhere. So we had four weeks away. We made three because I just couldn't stand it any longer. <laughs> Nothing to do with his friendship, of course. Sorry, Steve, if you are, listen to this. All right, so there you are. This is what we would do. And we ended up in a place called Interlaken, right in the middle of Switzerland, OK? Now, these aren't those mountains either, but that's beside the point. But the reality of the matter is, I remember 18 years old, thinking I probably knew a bit more back then than I really did. I think, you know what I mean? You think you know quite a bit when you're younger, don't you? Well, I'm not sure I do. But I remember seeing in the distance these mountains, like the Jungfrau, I think, is one of the mountains. And there's a range of mountains. And I said to Steve, I says, right, we're going to walk towards these mountains, because I don't think they're that far away. And he goes, what are you on about, Downing? And, of course, I walked about three-quarters of a mile with him and we were nowhere nearer to these things at all. And, you know, there's a slight principle in that because, actually, say you were standing at the front peaks of these mountains just here, you might think to yourself, as you're looking, that the second peak of mountains are actually not that far away. And you might think to yourself that the third peak behind the second set of mountains isn't that far away either. But I kid you not, it's a false perspective. Because actually, there's quite a bit of distance between peak one, peak two, and peak three. And so on, if that is the case. Why am I saying this? Well, I'm saying this for a good reason, really. That we can look at these mountains and have a false perspective on the distance apart that they are, but it's the same with the prophet Isaiah, except in his case, it was not mountain peaks so much, but time peaks, if you see what I mean. So what I'm saying is this. When we read this passage together, we're actually seeing something quite remarkable going on. We have peak one, which is when Isaiah prophesied to the people stuck in Babylon They'd gone there because of their sins and their wrongdoing. God had warned them time and time again to repent and turn away, but they would not and they refused to do it. So, 
Isaiah prophesied these wonderful words, which we'll get into in a few moments, and that was the coming true of these words. Peak one. He saw it in advance through God's power at work in him, and he saw peak one. Time peak one. Or if I'm going to be astronomical, Tim peak one, you could say. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm full of that sort of thing this morning. Anyway, and so that's level one. But there is also, from Isaiah's perspective in time, a greater period of time after that first peak, which he didn't know about. And the second peak in time is something else, and the third peak in time is something else. So let me explain these things as I go along. Does it sound vaguely of interest? I hope so. All right. So I brought my telescope along just for that very, very reason. Okay. The people from Judah, as I said, were in a very, very difficult situation. They'd been cast into Babylon for 70 years, the worst place you could imagine them ever going to. They were there because of the problems. But Isaiah, in advance of that time, had a prophetic word which comes in three levels, three peaks in time, as I said a moment ago. First is this. Comfort, comfort my people, says God. Isaiah, he says, on my behalf, speak tenderly. Speak comfort to my people, Jerusalem. Speak from the heart. Speak to Jerusalem's heart that their time in Babylon is coming to an end. And this is not so much just a word of comfort as in the sense of making someone feel better. It's actually a word of comfort that brings one out of their trouble and into joy. That time is going to come, says Isaiah. Peak one. Their warfare, their hard service, the things they had done at an assembled people together in Babylon had been filled up, completed, accomplished. It had come to an end. Why? Because all her sin, all her iniquity, literally the, uncrooked, the crooked, unstraight ways in their lives had been pardoned, paid for, and God was now to rescue her. And my friends, we often can make the mistake to think that God's grace is only seen in the person of Jesus Christ, but I tell you, herein, is God's grace for his people right there in the worst case scenario. You see, God had bound himself to these people through his covenant agreements. He would bound himself to them for so many years before and there is nothing else he could do because his heart was breaking for his people, ready to return them back from Babylon to the land of Jerusalem. And so God speaks, he speaks his word and he acts upon his word. And that's the incredible thing about the Bible. When God speaks, he acts always. In fact, it wouldn't be his word if he didn't act. The two things go together like that. And so through Isaiah, his word reaches into history. Through Isaiah, his mouthpiece. And God breaks in. But what's so extraordinary is this. Yahweh the Lord is going to do something remarkable. He's going to take them out of Babylon, yes, back to Jerusalem. But he is going to personally walk with them. He's going to make a way in the impossible terrain that goes from Babylon to Jerusalem. Because to be honest with you, it might not have been mountains like this, but it was heavy stuff, very, very dry, very, very arid, and very, very difficult to get across. And so, God says, by your hand, I'm going to take you, my people, I'm going to take you out of the place you've been in. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. In fact, I am going to literally be with you personally in an amazing way. Because after all, that's where they really belonged. With God. Not just back in a place called Jerusalem. And so the highway's built, if you like. Figuratively speaking, the highway in the wilderness, the desert road... All the mountains, can you imagine it, raised, pushed right down. All the mountains raised up. Everything that's rugged and bad levelled out so that there is a straight dead path for God with his people to walk back to Jerusalem 
right to the place where they have been removed many, many years, back in 586 BC. Every obstacle is going to be removed. Everything's going to be sorted out. God is going to walk with his people. And in 516 BC, guess what? That's what happened. Time, peak, one, fulfilled. Amen? God said, I would do it before the time came. Isaiah prophesied it. He knew it was going to happen. And in 516, whack. That was it. The people left and went on their way back to Jerusalem. After which we know the second temple was going to be built. But there is more. This is where time peak two now comes in. Is this really, really important? And I'm so pleased. By the way, well done, music group, this morning. I thought it was super what you did. And the things that Clive said and led and what Anna said as well, wonderful, because it all fits in, you see. When Isaiah prophesied these words, there was another future historical prediction in God's mind. And it's this. Through John the Baptist... And the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, we see time peak number two fulfilled. Matthew 3, 3, John the Baptist said this with regard to Jesus. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Hallelujah. There's that verse applied to Jesus Christ. So yes, prepare the way for the Lord Prepare the way for God. Yes, we know, don't we? Matthew 1, 23. Emmanuel, spelt with an I, I'd like to add. Emmanuel, God with us. That's who Jesus is. That's who John the Baptist was talking about. God in the Old Testament, now coming to earth. And I want to say this to us this morning. If ever there was a moment in history when there was mountain peaks and obstacles in the way, that that was the moment when God walked into history on the straightest, most determined road ever so that he could come and sort the world out. And that was with the coming of Jesus. So we say hallelujah, because with the coming of Jesus, everything has changed. And by the way, I should throw this in, I just suddenly thought of it, if it wasn't for the fact that the people had gone back to Jerusalem in the first place, there could never have been the birth of Jesus in the first place out of the Jewish nation for him to be there in that very place. So it all fits together. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Wonderful thing. So, Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, prophesied that Jesus would come. And, you know, I'll throw this in just for good measure. I can't even predict the weather, (laughs) let alone something that's going to happen hundreds of years before. And rumour has it Michael Fish has a bit of a problem with the weather as well, but we won't. (laughs) Hopefully he's not listened to the sermon today either. So God did this work. He did it. And with John the Baptist, what did he say to the people? Repent. Repent. As Anna said, you live in a certain way, Now it's time to go and live God's way. Head, heart, mind, soul, everything aimed now for Jesus who comes. And that's the same question for us now. Because this Jesus, Clive said it, Advent is actually every day. Because Jesus is always coming to us by his Holy Spirit. Always there. So we always need to be in that place of walking with God. In that place of repentance, if you like. So there's nothing in the way, ever, to block us from encountering Christ afresh right here, right now. It's not just about December, is it, folks? It's about Jesus every day. So let's get the straight pass if we need to, so that Jesus can walk afresh, as it were, into our lives. And as I was thinking about this, there's a very good reason why Jesus wants this. It's not just about say through our sins so much, although that's extremely important. It's because, as I've said so many times before, God wants to have that profound relationship with people. This is why Jesus came. This is why he came to earth and did these incredible things. Because the truth is this, God really wants you and me to love him more, doesn't he? He wants the love-to-love relationship. He wants the heart-to-heart relationship with his people. And I tell you, I don't mean this sound rude, it's not just about Sunday. 
It's about a dynamic relationship with him. And sometimes that word dynamic can sound awfully like, you know, fireworks and rockets are going to go off all the time. No, it's dynamic because we are a people who are to be one-to-one -one with him. And that's dynamic whether God speaks quietly or moves in incredible ways. Either way, Advent is not just for December. It is for us today to love him more, his heartbeat, his voice. All this, you know, is called prophetic telescoping, which is why I picked up the telescope and brought it along this morning. Prophetic telescoping, because we look through this telescope, as it were, to the peaks of time in advance. We see number one with the Babylon thing, number two with the coming of Jesus, and this is why we're here, to celebrate Advent and to recognise his coming in the world. But the third peak is this, and this is the one that I really, really like as well. Verse 5. This one, you know, might be some distance away. But I tell you now, if God has fulfilled his, ver his word twice in history already, Babylon and with Jesus, this third time peak is as guaranteed as the other two. In fact, God might say to us today, look at what I've done already. Look at my track record. I've done it once. I've done it twice. I'm going to do it a third time. And here it is. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Hallelujah for that verse. You see, with the coming of Jesus, yes, the glory of God was seen. Yes, the glory of God was known, because I said only the other week with our John series, you know, glory was seen in the person of Jesus. But you know something? The world, mankind together has never yet seen his glory in the way I believe this verse describes. Time peak three is this. One day, Jesus will come back and his glory will be seen by everybody. And every knee is going to have to bow, my friends, either because they are made to or because they want to. And I'll tell you now, I'd kneel down right now for him because he is my Lord and he is my saviour. No matter what knot I can get myself in during various days and weeks, he is my king and my lord. And when he comes back, my friends, it is going to be absolutely, unbelievably brilliant. Hallelujah. See Jesus face to face in that moment. How about that? One day, the universe will know the truest and most deepest revelation of the glory of the God who lives. So Advent, my friends, it's not just about Babylon, it's about Jesus coming, it's about, for me, Jesus coming back again. And isn't it funny how that was touched on again in what was led earlier on? Not funny ha-ha or funny peculiar, but just a statement, you know what I mean, yeah? So he's coming in his splendour and he's coming in his wonder. And it is going to be absolutely brilliant. It really, really is. And for us personally today, what might this mean? Well, have you ever felt like you've got valleys and mountains in your own life? Yeah. <laughs> you see, in a funny kind of way, the word of God always speaks to us personally as well as these incredible things we're talking about now. But I want to say today that I believe God would say, never define me or define yourself by what you perceive with your human eyes. Because I am the God who can make roads in the desert place, even if it is in you and in your life. We must not ever regulate him into anything else. So how do we find, how do we define ourselves today? Maybe some people might say, I'm very old. Do you think some of us might sometimes say that and it becomes a little bit of a self-definition? Well, Methuselah made it to 969, so I think you're doing okay, really. You may say, I am not gifted like other people. Anyone ever said anything like that? Anyone ever compared themselves to perhaps someone they know and they say, oh, that Christian's got so many gifts, 
I'm not like that. Sometimes that can be our definition. I throw this in. Have you ever looked at those Old Testament characters and how every single one of them said they were not up to what God asked them to do? Yeah? Isn't that the truth? Yeah? Moses said he couldn't speak very well and he stuttered. Jeremiah said he was too young and Gideon was afraid. Who can blame them, really, with the things they had got called to do? But that is the reality of it. And here's another one. Paul, in the New Testament, said he was an unskilled speaker in spite of the fact he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Some people say, when my faith feels a bit stronger and I feel a bit closer to God, then I'll be ready. Sometimes it might be the sins in our life, perhaps specific sins. We never seem to get any victory over, no matter how much we pray and ask God. But I want to tell you this. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, it is who he says you are that counts. It's about your heart and who you are and your relationship with him. Because the reality is this. There is never going to be a day when you and I are perfect this side of glory. There's always going to be something that ain't quite right. Am I right? So therefore, it can't be about you and me. It can't be about whether we're too busy or we want to be retired or whatever else it might be in between. The reality is this. Advent tells me that if Jesus Christ can come into an obstacle-ridden world with all its rubbish and dirt and problems under the rule of the severest of empires, the Roman Empire, And he has, therefore, victory over you and me and all those things in our lives that we do honestly struggle with if we're truthful and honest. There is no mountain, there is no valley that can get in the way of Jesus doing his work through you. All he wants is your heart, just wants you, the real you, to say, yes, Lord, I've got mountains and valleys, but I believe you. I believe you, that you can do it. One of my daughters once gave me this, and I shan't say who because it will probably embarrass her because she's sitting here. (laughs) She once said a little thing she got through on one of these social media things. Your diagnosis is not your identity. As Christians, we diagnose ourselves as this, this, that and the other all the time. But your identity is Christ in you the hope of glory and we are a people raised up in him right now and if we could only grasp the depths of that we would really begin I think to get away from the clutter and all this stuff that so often is in the way because Christianity you know is not just of being saved from something it's of being saved to something to a life to be lived by Jesus, for lived, lived for Jesus. Faith is not just something we say we have, like, I, I believe this, I have faith in this. Faith is actually a doing word. Book of James tells us that. I have faith and I have deeds, and both work together. So God is the God of new highways, always in you and me. He's done it in history twice. He's doing when it comes again, and right in the middle is you and me, right here, right now. The highways, God, touching us, even today. Don't let, please don't let, me, you, any of us, ever think, just because we've got struggles, that we cannot be involved in the things of God. Because Jesus is bigger than all those things. We've got to believe that, my friends. Really, we do. In the new year which proves I'm relatively organised because I'm already thinking. I want to talk in the mornings about who does God say I am. And I think that's really important. Having just recently looked, of course, at who Jesus is, I want us to now look at who does God say I am. Because the gospel is good news. And I really want us, if you like, together, to experience the wonder of what the gospel is all about, afresh again, maybe for the first time. 
And I really do hope it will be a building up time for all of us so that by the end of it all, we will say, I absolutely recognise him far more than I see the stuff in me. That's not to say that we don't need to deal with the things in us. Of course we do. But it's through that relationship and position we have in Jesus. In the meantime, this is Advent. Advent day one. Can you believe Christmas is only 23 days away? You're all not smiling at that one. <laughs> so let's celebrate Advent today and the fact that Christ can come afresh today by his spirit.